And now we move immediately to the second paper of this session, which is presented by Arndt Gerrit Kund from the European Stability Mechanism, and it's also co-authored by Andreas Bayer. Yeah, good afternoon also from my side. Uh, thanks a lot for the kind introduction and thanks for having me today. My name is Arndt Gerrit Kund, and as already mentioned, I present joint work with Andreas Bayer. So that means that the usual disclaimers for what I'll be presenting apply. The paper that we brought today deals with internal models, internal models in banks that are used in order to calculate RWA. And what we're trying to show you in the next few minutes is that we think it is a super important topic, but at the same time, a little bit under-researched. And we want to explain not only why we think that it is so important, but we also want to do a little bit maybe in the spirit of the SSM leveling the playing field to begin with, because we think that this discussion on internal models in and by itself is a little bit technical. But let's take it one step at a time, and let's try to convince you first why this is actually a super interesting topic to look at. And in order to do that, I want to make two arguments. And let me maybe start with the bars that you see on the right of the slide. So what we've done is we brought basically the distribution of the risks, if you will, in the, of the banks in the West Ham. And you can see that the majority of risks that we actually observe for the banks in our sample, that are SSM banks with internal models, are unsurprisingly in the credit risk realm, and more importantly, coming from an internal model. So to make it maybe a little bit more palpable with numbers, we can say that roughly three-fourths of all RWA that we observe in the banks come from one of the internal models. Thereby, you can already make a strong case in the sense of how big is the impact that these models actually have? And maybe not only if we look at it in the absolute terms, but also try to get a little bit a feeling for what happens if something is wrong with them. Let's try to look at, let's try to have a look at that as well. And one way to look at this is what we'll focus on for the paper, that is the so-called limitation. Meaning that whenever there's something wrong with the model and it produces an underestimation of the risk, there will be a limitation where the bank is asked to set aside additional capital to cover for this risk. And if we try to come up with a CT1 equivalent impact of this limitation, we actually end up in the density of roughly 64 billion euro, which is a big impact if you compare it, for example, against the sanctions that the ECB has imposed. And maybe you can even make a case that for some of the banks, it's a big impact compared to capital requirements we derive from the threat. So that being said, I think we already have two arguments in the sense of internal models are used very frequently. They have a big impact for the RWA. And also they have a big impact on the capital side. And I hope with that, I've already created a little bit of the appetite to understand closer what is actually going on with these models. So let's delve a little bit deeper and try to actually understand what we're trying to look at. Because I was already foreshadowing, we're trying to understand a little bit better these limitations when the supervisor imposes something on the bank in order to remediate a risk underestimation. And to maybe better understand where this is coming from, on the next slide we'll walk you briefly through the life cycle, how we come up with such a limitation to begin with. And to understand it better, we basically start with the first step, meaning an on-site inspection. A team from the ECB or national supervisor goes on-site and checks the model. They may find some non-compliances with the regulation. This is what we call findings. And then they will also assess the severity of this finding, meaning how big is the non-compliance. It ranges on a scale from the F1s, which is a low severity finding, to the F4s, which is a very high severity finding. And basically what we can do is we can track these findings and how they may ultimately lead to a limitation. If there's a big underestimation in the model through this life cycle where the issue is solved and ultimately remediated. And we make one important point here, because we're not only following this life cycle, but we're already dissecting the life cycle. Because an important problem that we are also solving here is that we're not only looking at the limitation itself, but that we focus explicitly on the part that comes from the non-compliance with the model. So what does that mean in detail? Let me again try to elaborate a little bit more in detail. 
And you see on the slide basically three blocks that I'll try to explain how we actually come up with the mutation that is our variable, our dependent variable. On the very left hand side, you can see more or less the cover sheet of one of these internal model inspections. And it would give you also a good estimate in this reddish box where you see the RW impact from the model inspection. And now, if you look a little bit closer, you realize that we have a negative sign. It should be a little bit confusing because it would imply that although we impose a limitation, the bank is actually saving capital. How can the RWA go down? This is something that we actually disentangle in our paper because we're not going the easy way and just take the number from the report. But we go the hard way and we actually read the parts of the report, which is this middle block, that explain how this number comes to be. And in doing that, we find, in essence, two opposing effects that I have summarized in the table on the very right-hand side. There's one effect from what the bank has changed with the model, and what has triggered the inspection in the first place. That's basically the model change. The bank thinks that with the new model, it should save roughly 700 million in uh, RWA because it can calibrate something more reliably because it has updated the data, you name it. But at the same time, we find non-compliances which we can pinpoint to particular issues and impose actually this limitation of the 337 million. And this is the important distinction that we make because we look exclusively at the limitation. So you could also argue, we look at a proxy for the not self-identified model risk, if you will. And we're trying to understand now a little bit better what is actually the driver behind this limitation. Or said differently, what has to go wrong in a bank such that it gets this limitation? To sum it up a little bit and to also show what we'll focus on in the next slides, I've basically clarified what the limitation is, what we're trying to look at. And now we're trying to build the bridge between this life cycle that I was showing earlier. So we're trying to establish how the limitation connects to the severities, and there's even an additional step that we can make, how it also connects to what are the non-compliances. Because we can also see how it connects to the capital requirements regulation, meaning which part of it did you actually infringe. And what we actually find in dissecting this, this link, if you will, is that only the very high severity findings matter for the limitation. But how do we actually get to that conclusion? Let's have a look at the results. And I brought this big table. I want to explain it a little bit step by step and in essence walk you through the columns. You can see in the first column basically our baseline specification, if you will. We'll look at the four different findings that I already introduced in the sense of the low severity and the high severity findings. And we find that only the very high severity findings, the F4s, have a statistically significant impact on the limitation. Meaning if I have more of the F4 findings, I'm also more likely to have a higher capital impact from them. And now we're trying to understand this link a bit, little bit better. Because you could also argue that maybe it's not so much about the finding severity in and by itself, but maybe there's also something that's coming from the interaction of how many of these findings do I actually collect? Do we have the model with only one big finding that's an issue, or are there rather numerous not so severe findings piling up? This is what we actually want to check in the second column, where we interact the low severity findings, so that's the number of F1, F2, with the respective high severity findings F3 and F4. And again, what we find is that is in particular the F4 findings, which are crucial to understand what drives this limitation. And now you might say, okay, um, this is actually fair enough, but maybe there's something bank specific that actually explains why this limitation is imposed to begin with. And fair enough, let's have a look at that. We come up with a few bank level controls that we introduce in the third column. And basically what we find is that most of them are insignificant, but for two of them actually, we believe that there's an interesting story to look at. And these are the capital headroom, so how much additional capital above the minimum requirement do you have, and the cost of risk. And we believe that in particular, this part is interesting because it opposes also a little bit divergent views, if you will. Let's look at capital headroom first. You could make a case from the positive coefficient that better capitalized banks with more capital headroom receive stricter limitations from the ECB. 
maybe a little bit in the sense of well, they can afford it, question mark, yeah? And maybe you can even make a case that it's holding true also from the other perspective. If we look at the cost of risk, riskier banks appear to receive lower limitations. So maybe they can not afford it. But this is only one way of seeing it, because at the same time, we must also understand that actually risk in this context of the models is something that we appreciate. And what do I mean by that? All these models are calibrated against defaults, because only if one of your clients defaults, you can come up with a model that tries to predict this default. So you can vice versa make a case where you actually argue that the, uh, say in quotation marks, that the risky, that the bad banks are the good banks in this context, because only they allow us to reliably calibrate models and to reliably come up with these internal estimates of the probability of default. But let's take it one step further, because I was saying earlier that we also want to understand the link to the CRR tickets. So what specifically is the non-compliance about? And also here we find a subset of articles, which we call CRR prevalent, that basically serves a little bit like an early warning signal, where you can say that if you're non-compliant with a particular part of the CRR, this is going to be more likely to lead to a limitation that is imposed in your model. And maybe last but not least, a story that's uh, always a little bit close to the ECB. Everybody asks about the TRIM, the target value of internal models. What did that do to the models? And also here we find a little bit of a story in the sense that after it was completed and we had leveled the playing field, the model inspections that preceded that came along with higher capital impacts. That being said, let's try to understand a little bit closer the links and now focus in particular on the CR articles that we identified as early warning signals. And I want to do this a little bit as an eyeballing exercise to begin with. You see on the left-hand side, a lot of graphs. You don't have to understand all of them, but more the high-level message. Basically, each graph is a bucket of a provision from the CRR. And as we move through time, we can see on our y-axis how non-compliances with this particular provision build up. And our point here would be that you can just from eyeballing realize that there are in particular four categories where we see a big jump, a big buildup in these non-compliances. And they're actually somewhat natural, you could argue. I brought these four articles with me today, and more or less the storyline here is that they treat the way that actually the data that are input into the model are handled. So you face a little bit the issue that if the data you use for the model in the first place is not reliable, the model will not be reliable with its outputs either. Now that's more or less the story of the first two articles, and the last two articles are very specific then to whether the model tries to predict the probability of default or the loss given default. But let's also make sure that we are on the right trail here, right? This was just an eyeballing exercise, so let's get a little bit deeper to it. And again, I want to reinforce the point I was making earlier a little bit visually, but also statistically on this slide. On the left-hand side, we have again the two groups that I was mentioning earlier. So the CRR prevalent articles, the four I was showing earlier, and all the other articles where we observe non-compliance. And for comparison, I put them on the same scale, and we can make one interesting observation here. Although we have in absolute terms more infringements with the residual bucket, the highest severity, meaning the red part on the very top, is notably bigger for these CRR prevalent articles. So there's also this link, how it basically trickles down. You're non-compliant with a particular article. This means you're more likely to get an F4. This means you're also more likely to get the limitation. And now it's not only an eyeballing exercise, but we basically run a t-test across the different samples, and we can find that also in statistical terms is statistically significantly different. With that being said, I hope that by now I could convince you that basically the F4 findings are a crucial part to look at because they have a big impact on these limitations, which in turn have a big impact on the RWA in banks and also the capital that banks hold against it. But we also wanted to make sure that the story is not only pruned in the sense of how we establish the links, but also check different things like reverse causality in this particular example. So what actually did we check here? One of the stories that I was mentioning earlier talked about the capital headroom. 
the capital headroom, how it could be a way to interpret our results as saying that better capitalized banks receive stricter limitations. And an argument that was made was basically, what if it's the other way around? These banks are only better capitalized because they have not yet received the limitation. And this is exactly what we try to check here. And our approach is a little bit like an event study, if you will. Because effectively, the inspection is a little bit the treatment. You're getting inspected, and either afterwards you get the limitation or you don't. And in order to check this, we basically plotted in this orange the um, capital headroom through time, centered around the inspection date, and then we see that it's more or less flat. Uh, so the actual inspection is not a driver in the sense of reverse causality. We see a little bit of variation towards the end, which is why we plotted the bars behind it, so that you can see the actual number of observations that we have. Uh, where we would argue that basically this variation in the tails is just from the lack of observations to be found. And with that being said, and also a little bit in the spirit of the panel, let's try to wrap up what we actually learned here. And I would argue that there are three main messages. The first one is a little bit along the lines of the early warning signal that I was mentioning earlier. We can identify some articles in the CRR that are apparently early warning signals in the sense that we should put supervisory resources there because these findings are more likely to lead to bigger capital impacts. So in the sense of a risk-based supervision, in the sense of making the best use of our resources, we could try to prioritize there. Another story could be on the risk sensitivity because we can also make two cases in either direction. Maybe we have to be a little bit more critical if there's some bias in the sense that we are stricter with better capitalized banks and lenient with less well-capitalized banks. But at the same time, should we appreciate the risky banks, which have all the defaults that we need in order to actually come up with good models? And then, last but not least, also a little bit in the interest of supervisory resources, given that only the force a statistically significant driver of the limitation. Maybe it makes inter maybe it makes sense to also deprioritize the low severity findings, the F1s, the F2s. Basically, the findings that if I go back make up the majority of the workload. And with that being said, I want to conclude here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, and the um, discussant is Elisabetta Sisova from Norwegian School of Economics. Um, first of all, thanks a lot uh, to the organizers for all their efforts and also trusting me to discuss their paper. So maybe a short disclaimer, I actually also did my PhD at KU Leuven and uh, Hans was my co-supervisor. And uh, I think three years ago, Olivier discussed my paper when I was a PhD student. So there are more spillovers here than you can actually um, see from the outside. But anyway, uh, what actually um, came out as, a, as my uh, PhD topic was actually the model-based regulation. And I'm actually very happy to see now the, um, the emerging interest back to this topic. Uh, so Arm did already a great job uh, presenting the paper, but basically what I want to highlight here is that there's model-based regulation of banks that uh, allows banks to use the internal models to determine uh, risks and measure their capital requirements internally is now back on the rise again, given the risk management failures last year, that's what was also mentioned in the keynote, but also the uh, recent proposal by Federal Reserve, which is also known as the Basel III and GAIN proposal, that seeks to actually abandon internal models for at least credit and operational risk in the United States. And this brings us uh, back to the question whether the internal models are actually that bad and what are the underlying trade-offs. So the trade-off that um, this paper particularly speaks to would be the signal versus noise trade-off, where the authors use this severity of model imperfection, so they also call these deficiencies as a sort of a proxy for the signal while they look at the number of these model imperfections as a noise and try to study what actually dominates when we think about their effects on their capital requirements. 
So the paper uses hand-collected data from uh, confidential supervisory reports uh, uh, on the uh, banks that are on the joint supervision of the ECB and national authorities, that being the SSM banks between the 2014 and 2020 period. And um, in particular, an additional step that uh, Arn mentioned, what they try to do is to, um, to, to explore whether there are any specific non-compliance categories that exist with capital regulation that the authors also call the CRR, uh, whether they actually drive the ultimate results and the ultimate effects on the capital requirements. And given that the within this sample period, something very relevant happened being this uh, targeted review of internal models exercise in 2016, the authors try to also better understand what is the joint effect of the internal model inspections that happened at that time and the effect of the ECB TRIM exercise. So the main results in the paper are the following. So the, 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 the one, uh, the, the, the one first result is like thinking about this signal versus noise trade-off is that it seems uh, that the severity of this model imperfection actually dominates over the noise. So basically, how bad is the problem matters more uh, for banks' capital requirements compared to the number of these problems supported. Uh, what I find also very interesting is that the authors are able to actually spot the uh, very specific categories within the uh, within this uh, in non-compliances with capital regulation, including the initial approval of using the RB approach and also requirements for model estimations and the uh, own estimates of the loss given default parameter, for instance. And thinking about the, this joint effect of the trim exercise and internal model inspections happened at the same time, there seems to be uh, on average higher supervisory uh, additional capital uh, requirements imposed during that period. So, um, and uh, probably consistent with what Arn said, one of the, I think, key policy messages here is that uh, thinking about the now, uh, again, focus back on investing in bank supervision, that actually uh, we can do more in terms of better allocation of limited supervisory resources, and definitely this paper uh, contributes, contributes to, that, uh, to that aspect. So my overall assessment, oh, sorry, yeah, so I think there are a couple of very unique and key contributions in this paper that I think the authors can actually um, elaborate a bit more in the current version, being, first of all, the uniqueness of the data that they use. So the data is uh, coming from mainly the supervisory reports in this confidential, but the authors are actually um, able to collect many, many uh, new things that are normally publicly unobservable, being this additional supervisory capital requirements, uh, all this information about model imperfections, the severity and number of them. They actually, I would think also, they observe the reasons for imposing a certain capital requirement. And um, importantly, as Arn showed, they also observe the timing of these different stages in the model inspections. And I think it would be great to actually use these differences in timing for, um, for elaborating on certain results. And to the best of my knowledge, at least, I learned a lot from this paper in terms of how actually these internal model inspections work, right? How actually the supervisor approach this model revision process, what are the different phases, what, are, what is, comes first, what comes second, what comes as an outcome. I think this is a unique work, and if you are interested in this topic, I highly recommend you to read on these uh, unique features. So here, my three suggestions would go over um, actually a couple of things that probably uh, would try to bridge the gap between the research that we academics do and what people do uh, uh, as policymakers. That's why probably the first suggestion that I have would be to think a bit more about the trade-offs uh, and particularly the one when banks actually ask for this internal model inspection. So I'm not sure Arndt actually mentioned this, but the internal model inspection, at least the way it is given in the paper, um, is not the initiative of the supervisor. It's the bank who actually requests the model uh, inspection. And uh, either this comes at the stage when they want to get an initial approval to use this IRB approach, or for instance, they propose a certain model change and they seek exposed approval by the supervisor to use this new model. And as a result of this inspection, either 
basically all who the banks can use this new model, or if there are certain problems with the model spots, the supervisor may impose an add-on and also require to actually implement, uh, implement certain revisions to the model. And uh, the way I would think about this, as a sort of thinking about the trade-off uh, for a bank who wants to actually get lower capital requirements would be the following. So thinking about the potential benefits here, right? What the bank, the capital saving bank would try to do is to change the model and try to sort of game the rules versus as a potential cost, he face um, possibly some, uh, some costs on the side from the model inspection, but also possibly this capital add-on. And I think, uh, like trying to understand better these benefits and costs, the authors uh, uh, could better clarify what is actually the likelihood of detection of this model imperfection, what is the likelihood also of observing this additional add-on or limitation as uh, Arn posited it, and whether what the, the main results that they find, which is this relation between uh, uh, observing a limitation only with the most severe timing is just the verification of institutional settings. So basically that the supervisor can only impose the limitation when they observe the severe problems. So I think elaborating on a bit on this uh, aspect would be, would be great and provide some additional tests for that. Um, another, uh, another probably related comment would be based on the, uh, based on already, uh, quite extensive literature here on the risk weight manipulation is to think about alternative explanations for actually observing lower model-based capital requirements. So Mike Maretasan and Warda Mirosh in their seminal work, and by coincidence, Mike was my PhD advisor, they highlight four possible alternatives actually for, for observing that. And uh, it could be that they just there were wrong model assumptions, it could be strategic risk modeling, it could be that just banks reallocate the assets from the class that has higher risk weights to the lower risk weights would be also that banks are actually good and they improve their risk management, right? So there are uh, multiple reasons for why we could actually ultimately observe lower, uh, lower capital requirements. And I think the authors have actually uh, this, uh, this unique data that they can actually disentangle between these uh, alternative channels and particularly distinguishing between sort of honest mistakes versus strategic mistakes, right? because ultimately that would kind of determine quite a bit what should be the optimal punishment, right, the optimal limitation. Um, my last suggestion is sort of actually kind of a byproduct of the previous two, and I think if the authors uh, kind of uh, set up more clearly the trade-offs and uh, talk about the reasons, right, probably the policy implications that are currently in the paper are quite general, I think can be more specific, like thinking about what should be the particular um, particular policy measures that actually would allow us to improve the effectiveness of the supervision and improve also the design of these limitations or additional capital add-ons. I have a series of minor suggestions that I'm happy to share with the authors uh, later on. And with that, let me just maybe conclude that I do believe, as someone who has done some work in this field, this is a definitely a unique, a very relevant piece of work that really sheds uh, lots of light on terms of how these internal models uh, inspection work. Also, outstanding data work, and I want to congratulate the authors on that, on actually hand collecting the, all these data. And uh, good luck with the paper, and uh, I will be happy to talk with you bilaterally on the things. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. And before giving the floor back to Aunt Gary to respond, I would like to collect questions from the audience, first of all, in the room. Any questions from the room? Mario. Uh, just one on uh, your story, too, as you can guess. This is the one uh, which is uh, more difficult to digest uh, for, the, for the SSM. So first, uh, um, I, I, we discussed this already in the past, now uh, on the causality of the being well capitalized and getting uh, more severe limitations. Uh, one question is whether you checked uh, the uh, risk with asset density of the banks, uh, which are better capitalized as a sort of control uh, for your story. And then let's say this is perhaps more an accounting question than a, a research question, but what you 
um, have shown to us is that the better capitalized banks, uh, they get uh, more severe limitations and still they, are, still they are better capitalized at the end of the process. But then how comes? I mean, because they raise capital, uh, they retain earnings, so it's, you would expect the limitation in a mechanistic way just to increase the risk weighted assets and then uh, get uh, lower capital headroom. If the headroom remains constant, this means they've done something else on the on the capital side. So I wonder whether you have any insights on this one. Thank you. Any other questions from the room, please? This is an outsider's uh, question. Uh, now, internal models are not only used for uh, credit risk, uh, uh, for assessing the um, risk weights for credit risk. Uh, they are also used to uh, compute uh, expected losses for the accounting uh, of, uh, um, uh, and, and so somehow, I mean, we have two measures of credit risk, the one coming from the accounting uh, uh, approach, the other one are coming from the, uh, uh, risk assessment for the uh, regulators. And, uh, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, one of them is uh, mostly based on a point in time perspective, whereas the other one is using a through the cycle type of approach. Now, somehow, I mean, this kind of uh, uh, contrast is something that has always uh, worried me. And, and it seems that uh, supervisors tend to ignore the saying that, uh, well, this is something for the accounting standards, it's not for us. But somehow, I mean, basically, it's the same reality, isn't it? Okay, any further questions or something from the online community that's not the case? Then I hand back to Aunt Gerrit to respond, please. Thank you very much for the very good discussion uh, and also for the very good questions. So maybe I just start real quick with the discussion because um, my feedback there would be, in essence, to say very good suggestions. Uh, we'll have a closer look there. Um, of course, the data set is very unique, but for us, it's also a little bit the balance of not writing a book about explaining how the SSM actually does a model inspection, but actually writing an academic paper. So we're trying to strike a little bit the balance there. Um, that being said, and addressing the points from the room, so um, I'll start with Mara's point first. We did not explicitly uh, check the risk density as suggested, um, but we checked another thing on the capital headroom, and that was basically an observation in the sense that capital headroom and bank size also is very strongly related to one another, meaning that the bigger the bank becomes, the smaller the capital headroom comes. So this is rather an avenue that we're trying to understand a little bit better, whether this could be one of the effects that's actually superimposed there. And that being said, uh, I would now jump to the question on the ECL. Um, this is also something that we actually have in one of our robustness checks, which unfortunately just didn't make the cut for the version we handed in today. So uh, it's actually something we have on the radar, but we're trying to look at it a little bit from a different perspective. Because effectively, you would compare the expected credit loss from the internal model and from the accounting work. And we were trying to understand whether you get a shortfall or a surplus on the capital side based on whether you would be more pruned or more aggressive in calibrating one or the other. So for us, it's more about our to say differently, for us, the ECL is not so much about the point in time versus through the cycle comparison, but in this regard, more about am I being conservative with my model or am I being progressive with the model? So acknowledged, yes, there, there's a discussion there to be had about the timeliness, but I would say that for our paper, the usefulness lies more in, in this appetite for risk, if you will. Uh, how risky do I want to be on the model side? Then maybe there's something wrong and then I get this limitation from the supervisor. 